Hello, everybody. Joseph P. Farrell here. And as I promised in the last news and views from the Nefarium on, uh, oh gosh, March the 15th, I think it was, I am pre scheduling a bunch of blogs and was going to do some of them as kind of a little trial for video blogging, kind of expand our news and views and uh, maybe save some time. So, anyway, this is going to be the first in a little series of video blogs appearing on April 1st and th that is intentional because it may be a total disaster I don't know but I want to do a video blog a series of video blogs on what I call playing DARPA in other words I want us to step into the shoes imaginatively and try to put ourselves in the frame of mind of what it would be like and how they would go about doing their business in the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And this first little video blog I'm entitling The Historical Context because DARPA doesn't appear in a vacuum, in my opinion. Although I want to stress that in my talks on this subject over the next couple of video blogs, that I'm not basing this on any research or any known facts, any reference to any of DARPA's own publications or its website or anything of the sort, because I wanted to free myself and look at the historical context in which these types of institutions and agencies in various governments, Great Britain of course has its own version of DARPA, the French certainly do, uh, Germany had uh, its own kind of version of DARPA combination Area 51 in, in the Congo and so on and so forth. Certainly the Russians, the Chinese, India, Brazil, all of these countries probably have some similar group. But DARPA is the most famous because of course being in the United States of America the funding for this agency is quite extensive, its projects are quite extensive and it has played a significant role in the transformation of our world through the ARPANET, which later became DARPANET, and then finally, of course, the Internet. So it has played a major transformative role in our culture. So I want to look at the historical context in which these types of agencies arose. And I think to do so, we have to go back to the rise of technology, the rise of those technologies applied to instruments of war, particularly toward the end of the 19th and then of course the beginning of the 20th century, and then in World War I. Now I'm singling out World War I as the starting point for this historical context for the development of these types of agencies for a very significant reason. Because once again it, it was Germany that played a leading role in the evolution of these types of what Peter Dale Scott would call parapolitical or deep political power structures and, and agencies. And the reason why we have to look to Germany and World War I as a starting place for the matrix that forms these agencies is because during the war, of course, the British placed Germany under a very, very tight, restrictive blockade. And uh, as you can tell, I've, I've still got my sinus. But this blockade cut Germany off from a lot of strategic resources that Germany needed in order to prosecute the war, certainly to the length and extent that it did during World War I. As a result of this, the Germans very quickly formed a kind of a corporation, a strategic alliance of corporations that were involved in investigating how the German chemicals industry might be able to bypass some of the restrictions and shortages that were being caused by the British blockade. This in fact was part of the nexus or nucleus for how the Germans were able to synthesize nitrogen which was of course a crucial component in explosives that they needed for the war effort. So the matrix for this sort of thinking begins in the wartime necessities, I think, of World War I. To a lesser extent, the Allies did this, but they were not, as Germany was, or Austria-Hungary during World War I, they were not suffering from 
these types of strategic shortages. So you really see the matrix of this develop during World War I. Now, as we move forward in history, this matrix develops, of course, in the interwar period through huge technology transfers, first by the creation of IG Farben, which of course is the notoriously huge and powerful German chemicals cartel that basically became the economic engine behind the Nazi war machine. And these technology transfers were accomplished by patent arrangements and licensing agreements, particularly between IG Farben and American companies like DuPont, Standard Oil, Alcoa, and so on and so forth. I detail all of that in Saucers, Swastikas, and PSYOPs, these, these nexus of, of business relationships, licensing, and patent agreements. But during World War II, something unique happens. And we have to look to two countries in particular to see the emergence of this culture that will create a DARPA-like agency in the post-war world. We have to look to the United States of America on the one hand, and we have to look at Nazi Germany on the other. So let's turn first to the United States. The matrix for this type of agency, in my opinion, the historical context in the American context, comes about from the Manhattan Project, the creation of an enormous, huge, secretly funded project to develop the atomic bomb, placed under the command of, of General Leslie Groves. And General Groves, if, if we look at what he was doing, he was recruiting top scientists, he was building secret installations, and basically brainstorming their way to the acquisition of the atomic bomb, both the uranium and the plutonium bomb, during the course of the war. And their motivation, of course, for doing so was the fear that Nazi Germany was doing precisely the same thing. And again, I argue that case in, in uh, my book, Reich of the Black Sun. So we have to look at that. We have the creation of a huge bureaucracy, secretly funded, with a specific goal or purpose and intention in the founding of, of the Manhattan Project. Now let's jump across the ocean to Nazi Germany. When we turn to Nazi Germany, we've got something similar but yet very different in the creation of the Kammlerstab. I've written about this particular group a number of times in my books, beginning with Reich of the Black Sun and continuing all through the Nazi uh, books on, on Nazi secret weapons, the Bell Project, the aftermath of the war, Roswell and the Reich, and so on and so forth. The Kammlerstab was different from the Manhattan Project. It was a huge bureaucracy because, as I've pointed out, Kammler, SS General Hans Kammler, was in charge of the SS Building and Works Division. He had access to all of the slave labor in the concentration camps and so on. But the Kammler stop was unique in that the mission brief, so to speak, of this particular entity was to brainstorm its way to working out the technology trees of second, third, and fourth generation weapons and, and how to go about deliberately acquiring those systems. So in other words, it did not have a confined mission brief of the atomic bomb or any specific project. It was an umbrella organization and it actually published and circulated its own top secret journal of scientific papers allowing the scientists to see what each other were writing about, talking about, conceptualizing, and so on and so forth. And this is a crucial, crucial stage in the development of what I call a DARPA-like culture in the post-war period. Because in effect, what the Kammlerstab represents is a kind of early Nazi version of DARPA. We have to look at something else in Nazi Germany. And that's the creation of the SS on an Erbedienst, which was, of course, the Ancestral History and Research Bureau, you know, the humanities program with guns, as the researcher Peter Lavenda referred to it in his book, Unholy Alliance. The SS on an Erbe was tasked with researching all avenues that could expose or 
document or verify what was presumed to be the ancient Aryan heritage. And that included the esoteric, it included the occult, and so on. And the key point, as I've stressed many times before, is that Reichsführer SS Himmler, when he gave the decree founding this organization, actually stated that one of the purposes of all of this research was to utilize the potential of its military application. So in other words, we also have a culture in which you are going to be investigating the paranormal and indeed the on an air sponsored all sorts of nutty kooky experiments in that direction. So you have a culture with the commoner stop and the SS on an Erba that is going to create a matrix for an umbrella-like organization that is going to brainstorm its way into the acquisition of new technologies and also think about the consequences of the social transformations that those technologies will bring about. And that's an important point because as I pointed out in Saucer, Swasticas, and Psyops, the American historian Dr. Carol Quigley actually was writing a history, a kind of a social history, of the technologies of war and how they tend to organize human societies going all the way back to Byzantium, the Byzantine Empire. Now there's one more thing that we have to look at very carefully when we consider the Kammler stop and the historical context for the post-war creation of what I call the DARPA matrix. And that is in if you if you study what the Kammler stop did and the secret weapons projects that were occurring in Nazi Germany, it's almost a bizarre, bewildering array of things. But there is a unique feature that these projects, you know, the kooky ones and the successful ones both, have in common. And that is they were using known technologies or developing technologies and combining them in very, very unusual ways. Uh, we take, for example, the uh, alleged German suction saucer, jet propelled saucer projects. They were thinking in ways that were utterly outside of the box. And this again, too, is, is part of the case that I've argued in SS Brotherhood of the Bell and the other books dealing with the Bell Project. They were engineering ordinary technologies in unusually creative ways in order to gain access to the concepts that they were trying to bring about and realize in their in their secret weapons projects. It's that combinational methodology of combining technologies, of stepping outside of one discipline and into another and linking them, that is also a crucial, crucial component of, of the bureaucratic culture that existed in Nazi Germany. And as I'm going to be arguing in the rest of this little mini-series of, of playing DARPA, I'm going to be arguing is part of the matrix and thinking the conceptualization behind the creation of DARPA. So in other words, to conclude this part, part one, the historical context of matrix, I'm suggesting that DARPA's culture, the idea that we brainstorm our way, that we take conventional science and, and think of new ways to creatively employ and utilize it. This is a crucial step in the formation of the post-war secret weapons black projects culture that DARPA so typifies. So with that in mind folks I'm going to sign off this first attempt at a video blog. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think about this idea because I might be mixing and mingling written blogs and, and video blogs in the future depending on what your response to this is. So anyway, I'll see you tomorrow for part two. See you on the flip side, folks.